One of the funny things about owning a brain is that you have no control over the things that it gathers and holds on to, the facts and the stories. And as you get older, it only gets worse. Things stick around for years sometimes before you understand why you're interested in them, before you understand their import to you. Here's three of mine. When Richard Feynman was a young boy in Queens, he went for a walk with his dad and his wagon and a ball. And he noticed that when he pulled the wagon, the ball went to the back of the wagon. And he asked his dad, why does the ball go to the back of the wagon? And his dad said, that's inertia. He said, what's inertia? And his dad said, ah, inertia is the name that scientists give to the phenomenon of the ball going to the back of the wagon. <laughs> but in truth, nobody really knows. Feynman went on to earn degrees at MIT, Princeton. He solved the Challenger disaster. He ended up winning the Nobel Prize in physics for his Feynman diagrams describing the movement of subatomic particles. And he credits that conversation with his father as giving him a sense that the simplest questions could carry you out to the edge of human knowledge and that that's where he wanted to play. And play he did. Now Eratosthenes was the third librarian at the Great Library at Alexandria. And he made many contributions to science. But the one he is most remembered for began in a letter that he received as the librarian from the town of Swenet, which was south of Alexandria. The letter included this fact that stuck in Eratosthenes' mind, and the fact was that the writer said at noon, on the solstice, when he looked down this deep well, he could see his reflection at the bottom, and he could also see that his head was blocking the sun. Now I should tell you, the idea that Christopher Columbus discovered that the world is spherical is total bull. It's not true at all. In fact, everyone who was educated understood that the world was spherical since Aristotle's time, and Aristotle had proved it with a simple observation. He noticed that every time you saw the Earth's shadow on the moon, it was circular. And the only shape that constantly creates a circular shadow is a sphere. Q-E-D, the Earth is round. But nobody knew how big it was until Eratosthenes got this letter with this fact. So he understood that the sun was directly above the city of Swenet because looking down a well, it was a straight line all the way down the well, right past the guy's head up to the sun. Eratosthenes knew another fact. He knew that a stick stuck in the ground in Alexandria at the same time and the same day at noon, the sun's zenith on the solstice. The sun cast a shadow that showed it was 7.2 degrees off axis. Now, if you know the circumference of a circle, and you have two points on it, all you need to know is the distance between those two points and you can extrapolate the circumference. 360 degrees divided by 7.2 equals 50. I know it's a little bit of a round number and it makes me suspicious of this story too, but it's a good story so we'll continue with it. <laughs> he needed to know the distance between Swenet and Alexandria, which is good because Eratosthenes was good at geography. In fact, he invented the word geography. The road between Swenet and Alexandria was a road of commerce, and commerce needed to know how long it took to get there. It needed to know the exact distance, so he knew very precisely that the distance between the two cities was 500 miles. Multiply that times 50, you get 25,000, which is within 1% of the actual diameter of the Earth. He did this 2,200 years ago. Now, we live in an age where multi-billion dollar pieces of machinery are looking for the Higgs boson. We're discovering particles that may travel faster than the speed of light. And all of these discoveries are made possible by technology that's been developed in the last few decades. But for most of human history, we had to discover these things using our eyes and our ears and our minds. Armand Fizeau was an experimental physicist in Paris. His specialty was actually refining and confirming other people's results. And this might sound like a bit of an also rant, but in fact, this is the soul of science because there is no such thing as a fact that cannot be independently corroborated. And he was familiar with Galileo's experiments in trying to determine whether or not light had a speed. So Galileo had worked out this really wonderful experiment where he and his assistant had uh, a lamp. Each one was holding a lamp and Galileo would open his lamp and his assistant would open his lamp. And they got the timing down really good. They, they, they just knew their timing. And then they stood at two hilltops two miles distant. And they did the same thing on the assumption from Galileo that if light had a discernible speed, he'd notice a delay in the light coming back from his assistant's lamp. But light was too fast for Galileo. 
Uh, he was off by several orders of magnitude when he assumed that light was roughly 10 times as fast as the speed of sound. Fizeau was aware of this experiment. He lived in Paris and he set up two experimental stations roughly five and a half miles distant in Paris. And he solved this problem of Galileo's and he did it with a really relatively trivial piece of equipment. He did it with one of these. I'm going to put away the clicker for a second because I want to engage your brains in this. Now, this is a toothed wheel. It's got a bunch of notches and it's got a bunch of teeth. This was Fizeau's solution to sending discrete pulses of light. He put a beam behind one of these notches. If I point a beam through this notch at a mirror five miles away, that beam is bouncing off the mirror and coming back to me through this notch. But something interesting happens as he spins the wheel faster, he notices that it seems like a door is starting to close on the light beam that's coming back to his eye. Why is that? It's because the pulse of light, it's not coming back through the same notch. It's actually hitting a tooth. And he spins the wheel fast enough and he fully occludes the light. And then based on the distance between the two stations and the speed of his wheel and the number of notches in the wheel, he calculates the speed of light to within 2% of its actual value. And he does this in 1849. This is what really gets me going about science. Whenever I'm having trouble understanding a concept, I go back and I research the people that discovered that concept. I look at the story of how they came to understand it. And what happens when you look at what the discoverers were thinking about when they made their discoveries is you understand that they are not so different from us. We are all bags of meat and water. We all start with the same tools. I love the idea that different branches of science are called fields of study. Most people think of science as a closed black box, and in fact, it is an open field, and we are all explorers. The people that made these discoveries just thought a little bit harder about what they were looking at, and they were a little bit more curious, and their curiosity changed the way people thought about the world, and thus it changed the world. They changed the world, and so can you. Thank you. you think about the brain, you know, it's, it's sort of a difficult thing to understand because if I were to ask you right now, how does the heart work, you would instantly tell me it's a pump, you know, it pumps blood. And if I were to ask you how your lungs work, you would say it exchanges oxygen for carbon dioxide, that's easy. But if I were to ask you how the brain works, it's a hard thing to understand because you can't just look at a brain and understand what it is. It's not a mechanical object, it's not a pump, it's not an airbag. It's just like, if you held it in your hand when it was dead, it's just a piece of fat. And so to understand how the brain works, you have to go inside a living brain. Because the brain is not mechanical, the brain is electrical, it's chemical. Your brain is made out of 100 billion cells, and these cells are called neurons. And these neurons communicate with each other with electricity. And we're going to eavesdrop in on a conversation between two cells, and we're going to listen to something called a spike. But we're not going to record my brain, or your brain, or your teacher's brains. We're going to use our good friend, the cockroach. Not just because I think they're cool, but because they have brains very similar to ours. And so if you learn a little bit about how their brains work, we're gonna learn a lot about how our brains work. So I'm gonna put them in some ice water here. And then, yeah. So what's happening right now is that they're becoming anesthetized because they're cold blooded. They become the temperature of the water and they can't control it. So they just basically chillax, right? They're, gonna be, they're not gonna be able to feel anything. And let me just tell you a little bit about what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be doing a scientific experiment to understand the brain. So, this is the leg of a cockroach, and the cockroach has all these beautiful hairs and pricklies all over it. And underneath each one of those is a cell, and this cell is a neuron, and this neuron is going to send information about wind or vibrations. If you, try to if you ever try to catch a cockroach, it's hard because they can feel you coming before you're even there. They start running. So these cells are zipping up this information up to the brain using those little axons with electronic messages in there. So we're going to record by sticking a pin right in there. So we need to take off the leg of a cockroach. Don't worry, they'll grow back. And then we're gonna put two pins in there. One of the pins, these are metal pins, they're gonna pick up this electronic message, this electric message that's going by. 
So, we're now going to do the surgery. Let's see if you guys can see this. Yeah, it's gross. All right. So there we go. You guys can see his leg right there. So now I'm going to take this leg, I'm going to put it in this invention that we came up with called the Spiker Box. And this replaces lots of expensive equipment in a research lab so that you guys can do this in your own high schools or in your own basements if it's me. So there. Can you guys see that? All right. So I'm going to go ahead and turn this on. I'm going to plug it in. To me, it's the most beautiful sound in the world because this is what your brain is doing right now. You have 100 billion cells making this, these raindrop type noises. So let's go ahead and take a look what it looks like. Let's take, pull it up on the, on the iPad on the screen. I plug my iPad into here as well. So remember we said what that axe potential looks like. Look like a spike. We're going to take a look at what one of them looks like in just a brief second. We're going to tap here so we can sort of average this guy. So there we see it. That's an axon potential. You've got 100 billion cells in your brain doing this right now, sending all this information back about what you're seeing, what you're hearing. So we also said this is a cell that's going to be sort of taking up information about vibrations in the wind. So what if you do an experiment? We can actually blow on this and hear if we see a change. You guys are going to be ready for this? If I blow on it, you tell me if you hear anything. So let me just touch it with a little pen here. That was actually the neural firing range. It took a while in neuroscience to understand this. This is called rate coding, which is the, the harder you press on something, the more spikes there are, and that all that information is coming up to your brain. That's how you perceive things. So that's one way of, of doing experiments with electricity. The other way is that your brain is not only just reading or taking in electrical impulses, you're also sending out. That's how you move your muscles around. So let's see what happens if I've plugged in something that's electric into the cockroach like here. So I'm going to take two pins, I'm going to plug them onto the cockroach. I'm going to take the other end, I'm going to plug it into my iPod. It's my iPhone, actually. I don't know if you guys know this, but do you guys know how your earbuds work in your ears? You have a battery in your phone, your iPod, right? It's sending electrical current into these magnets in your earbuds, which shake back and forth, you like to hear things. But that electric current is the same currency that our brain uses, so we can send that directly to the cockroach leg, and hopefully, if this works, we can actually see what happens when we play music into the cockroach. Let's take a look. Can we turn it up? There we go. <laughs> so what's happening? So you see what's moving. It's moving on the bass. All those audiophiles out there that have awesome kick and car stereos know that bass speakers are the biggest speakers. The biggest speakers have the longest waves. The longest waves have the most current. And the current is what's causing these things to move. So it's not just speakers that are causing electricity. Microphones also cause electricity. So I'm going to go ahead and invite another person out on the stage here to help me out with this. So there we go. <laughs> this is the first time this has ever happened in the history of mankind. He would beat box to a cockroach leg. When you guys go back to your high school, think about neuroscience and you guys can begin the neural revolution. So thank you very much. Bye-bye. engineering professor at the University of Pennsylvania and my favorite hobby is photography and as I travel around the world I love taking photographs like these so I can remember all the beautiful and interesting things that I've seen but what I can't do is record and share how these objects feel to touch and that's kind of surprising because your sense of touch is really important. It's involved in every physical interaction you do every day, every manipulation task, anything you do in the world. 
And so the sense of touch, it's actually pretty interesting. It has two main components. The first is tactile sensations, things you feel in your skin. And the second is kinesthetic sensations. And this has to do with the position of your body and how it's moving and the forces you encounter. And you're really good at incorporating both of these types of sensations together to understand the physical interactions you have with the world and understand as you touch a surface, is it a rock, is it a cat, is it a bunny, what is it? And so, as an engineer, I'm really fascinated and I have a lot of respect for how good people are with their hands. And I'm intrigued and curious about whether we could make technology better by doing a better job at leveraging the human capability with a sense of touch. Can I improve the interfaces to computers and machines by letting you take advantage of your hands? And indeed, I think we can, and that's at the core of a field called haptics, and this is the area that I work in. It's all about interactive touch technology. And the way it works is, is you move your body through the world. If, as an engineer, I can make a system that can measure that motion and then present to you sensations over time that kind of make sense, that match up with what you might feel in the real world, I can fool you into thinking you're touching something, even though there's nothing there. All right, so here are three examples, and these are all uh, done from research in my lab at Penn. The first one is all about that same problem that I was showing. How can we capture how objects feel and recreate those experiences? And so the way we solve this problem is by creating a handheld tool that has many different sensors inside. It has a force sensor, so we can tell how hard you're pushing. It has motion tracking, so we can tell exactly where you've moved it. And it has a vibration sensor, an accelerometer inside, that detects the shaking back and forth of the tool that lets you know that's a piece of canvas and not a piece of silk or something else. And then we take the data that we record from these interactions. Here's 10 seconds of data. You can see how the vibrations get larger and smaller depending on how you move. Then we make a mathematical model of those relationships and program them into a tablet computer. So when you take the stylus and go and touch the screen, that voice coil actuator in the white bracket plays vibrations to give you the illusion that you're touching the real surface just like if you touch, drag back and forth on the real canvas. We can create very compelling illusions. We can do this for all kinds of surfaces. And uh, it's really a lot of fun. We call it haptography, haptic photography. And I think it has potential benefits in all sorts of areas like online shopping or maybe interactive museum exhibits where you're not really supposed to touch the precious artifacts, but you always want to. The second example that I want to tell you about comes from a collaboration I have with Dr. Margaret Maggio at the Penn Dental School. Part of her job is to teach dental students how to tell where in a patient's mouth there are cavities. And of course, they look at x-rays, but a large part of this clinical judgment comes from what they feel when they touch your teeth with a dental explorer. You guys have all had this happen. They go across. What they're feeling for is if the tooth is really hard, uh, then it's healthy. But if it's kind of soft and sticky, that's a signal that the enamel is starting to decay. And these types of judgments are hard for new dental student to make because they haven't touched a lot of teeth yet. And uh, you want them to learn this before they start practicing on real human patients. And so what we do is we add an accelerometer onto uh, the dental explorer, and then we record what Dr. Maggio feels as she touches different extracted teeth. And then we can play it back for you as a video with a touch track. So not just a soundtrack, but also a touch track that you can feel by holding that repeating tool. You can feel all the same things that the dentist felt when they did the recording and practice making judgments. So here's a sample one. Here's a teeth, tooth. It looks kind of suspicious, right? It has like all those um, brown stains. And you might be thinking, oh, we should definitely put a filling in this tooth. But truly, if you pay attention to how it feels, all the surfaces of this tooth are hard and healthy. So this patient does not need a filling. And these are exactly the kind of judgments that doctors make every day. And I think this technology that we've invented has a lot of potential for many different things in medical training because it's really simple and it does a great job at recreating what people feel through tools. I think it could also maybe help make games more interactive and fun and more realistic in the sensations that you feel. The last example I want to tell you about is, again, about human movement. So if any of you have ever learned sports, you know, how do you get good at something like surfing? You practice. You practice some more and more, right? Making small corrections, maybe getting some input from a coach, learning how to improve your motions. I think we could use computers to help make that process more efficient and more fun. And so here, for example, if I have six different arm movements that I want you to learn, you could come into my lab at Penn and try out our system. We use a Kinect to measure your motions. We show graphics on the screen, and then we also give you touch cues, haptic feedback on your arm, delivered by these haptic armbands, which have motors inside, and guide you 
you as you move. So if we put it together, as you're trying to track this motion, if you deviate, say maybe your arm is a little too high, we turn on the motors that are right there on their skin to let you know, hey, you should move down, almost like a coach gently guiding you and helping you master these movements more quickly and make more precise corrections. We developed this system for use in stroke rehabilitation, but I think there are a lot of applications, like maybe dance training or all sorts of sports training as well. And so now you know a little bit about the field of haptics, which I think you're gonna hear more about in the coming years. I've shown you three examples, and I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge all of the great students who work with me in my lab at Penn and my collaborators. Uh, they're a great group, and uh, I also wanna thank you for your kind attention. There has never been a time that, to make things as good as right now. Between what's available on the internet, like the stuff on YouTube, the stuff on Instructables, Make Magazine, between the quality of your teachers who know so much and the incredible availability of parts and tools and supplies, there's almost nothing that you can't make almost nothing you can't make if you really try. Now, in my career, I've made a lot of stuff. I've made uh, telescopes, I've made microscopes, I know people who've made electron microscopes, I personally made flamethrowers, I've made a four-story high trebuchet. Um, I've made some really dangerous stuff. My, my favorite is I made a battle bot when battle bots were kind of big. You know, it was metal, it had 20 horsepower motors, it had a carbon tip fireman cutoff saw in the front. That thing could, you know, eat its way out of a steel room. I've made, um, oh, just, just so many things. But not everything you have to make is dangerous to be cool. The point is, is that it's just fun to make stuff. And if you've got a really good idea, you can probably do it. Now, there are different styles of making things. There's do-it-yourself, and that's like, well, I'm gonna go fix the brakes on my car or put siding on my house. And that's an interesting kind of DIY. But there's hacking, where you take one item that's purposed for something else and turn it into something, you know, cooler, something different. There's bricolage, which means making things from found objects. There's kitting, which means you buy a kit, something complicated probably, and put it together. And there's inventing. And inventing is the best. The best kind of making things involves not just following directions from people who have done things before, but actually going out there, figuring out how to make something, doing the design yourself, and then actually building it. Now, I don't have a lot of time, but I want to get you started on your own invention project, maybe. So what I'm going to do live in real time, and something that scares me, is because it is live in real time, is I'm going to make an audio speaker out of stuff that I found in my kitchen on the night before I came to New York. Okay, so what I've got here is a block of wood. I've got some sandpaper. I've got some pieces of notebook paper folded up into a rough Z shape. I've got two magnets, and I've got some wire. Now, this wire is the key part. The four things that I need to make my own speaker is uh, a diaphragm, a coil, a, a support, and a magnet. So first things first, let's just start doing it. What I need to do is wind a coil. And what I'm going to do is take this wire and wind an entire voice coil from it. Now, unfortunately, that's going to take a really long time, and I don't have much time, so I'm just going to give you the flavor of it. I'm going to take 30-gauge magnet wire, and I'm just going to wrap it tightly together. And I'm going to do about 150 turns on, th on a three-quarter inch wooden dowel. Now, why would I do that? Because I want to get my coil to have about four ohms of resistance. If you don't have enough resistance, you can do something bad to your amplifier. And then once that's done, I'm going to glue it all together so it's nice and tight. Now, I don't nearly have 150 uh, coils there. So I made one in advance, and I'm going to use that one. So where it is? here it is. What I'm going to do is simply hot glue it to the back of this yogurt cup. And I had to eat a lot of yogurt while I was experimenting, so I feel like I've got all the calcium I need for a while. <laughs> now, the next thing I'm gonna do is take these magnets and glue it in the center of this dot. Hot glue, by the way, 
a hot glue gun, it's the greatest maker toy you can possibly have. I don't care what the 3D prototype guys say, I love my hot glue gun. Um, what I'm going to do next is take these little Z standoffs, see, and I'm going to put some glue there. Look how fast that bonds. My God, this is great stuff. And I'm going to do that, and then I'm going to glue this. And I'm going to center that coil right over those magnets so it's just above it. And now it's done. Now, this needs to dry. So you know how Martha Stewart would take the cake out of the oven? It's pre-made. We're going to do that. We're going to go to the Martha Stewart one. So this is the one I made earlier today. And it's the yogurt cup, the standoffs, and everything else. Well, I'm going to turn on my iPod, and we'll see if we can get some music. I need a microphone. Hello? It's on. Good deal. So, let's play something. Now, this is really coming from a yogurt cup, and it's, it's, it's kind of a neat deal. Might not be your choice of music. Now, you can experiment with different things. In fact, I did. Last night I did this. Let me walk over here. I made all these different speakers out of different things. Here's one, because I'm in New York, I made one out of a piece of matzah. I made one out of a coffee, uh, coffee cup lid. I made one out of a Tostito. The Tostito looks like a speaker, doesn't it? So you can imagine how good that works. And then last night, during rehearsals, they gave us some, some food. And they gave us these thick potato chips. You gotta hear this, you guys. This is just incredible how nice that sounds. just incredible. So anyway, like I said, today is the very best time. This age is the very best time to be a maker. You can make so many things if you put your mind to it. Um, get out there, pick something up, because I'll tell you, the stuff you make, the stuff you make is way better than the stuff you buy. It's special, it's significant to you, and I really encourage you to do that. Thanks a lot for listening to me. <laughs>